keep your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1. As we continue our series in the book of Colossians, which we've uh, titled Growing in Your Place, last week we, we, we heard from the Apostle Paul. Paul the Apostle. Paul the one who, when he spoke, he spoke the very words of Jesus, the sent one from Jesus, who saw the resurrected Christ. We hear from that Paul. Paul the Apostle. We learned last week that the, from the Apostle Paul that, that King Jesus is the song that we sing. He's above all. All. The word all. Everywhere in that song. We learned last week from the Apostle Paul that King Jesus is the map. In other words, Jesus is the God who is there. We also learned from the Apostle Paul last week that this same King Jesus put you and I on the map and invited us to come into what he's doing in his world. And we were told at the end of the message last week that we should look down at the foundation, the foundation of the gospel that we're standing on, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead. That's the gospel we stand on, and we need to continue in it. So we need to look down and put our roots down deep into that truth. That's what Paul told us to do, to continue in that, to grow in Jesus. That's from the Apostle Paul. Now today we're going to make a turn, and we're going to hear from Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul. The apostle is making known the truth and saying, this is the way it is, and making things clear. Very absolute terms, he speaks. And we need that. But now he's going to make a turn, he's going to talk as a pastor. People he cares for. What does it look like to be under the care of Pastor Paul. That's what you're going to see in today's text. What does it look like to be under the care of Pastor Paul? Or maybe we can put it in this term, and if you want to write this down, it would help you at the top of your outline, how to recognize a church where you can grow in your place. A church that would be like what Pastor Paul envisions. And we begin in chapter 1, verse 24, and actually, if you're interested, in, in the original language, uh, verse 24 through verse 29 is one long sentence. But look at verse 24. The first word in the NIV is the word now. Paul says, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. That word now is important. Because the word now, Paul is using to connect something that happened in verse 22. Look, look up a little higher in your, in your Bible. Look at verse 22 where Paul talks about that Jesus Christ reconciled us through his physical body on the cross. And then Paul talks about that and he connects what Jesus did on the cross to Paul's personal life mission. Look at verse 23. Paul at the end of verse 23 says, I've become a servant. This is my life mission. And then he says something puzzling in chapter 1, verse 24. And if you looked at it, you probably did a double take. What does Paul mean by saying that something is lacking in terms of Christ's afflictions? Paul says that he's filling up in his flesh something that's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Let's be clear that only, only, the suffering of Jesus forgives and reconciles only. So in that sense, nothing is lacking when it comes to what Jesus did for us on the cross. So what's Paul trying to say? Why, why does Paul have such a high view of himself? Why does Pastor Paul view himself this way in what he's going through? What Paul's doing is he's connecting his own life mission to what Jesus did in his Jesus' suffering. He's connecting those two together. Paul's suffering doesn't forgive anybody's sin. Only Jesus does that. But Paul does do something that Jesus do. Paul, Paul is enduring suffering for the benefit of others. Paul is actively following the life of Jesus. And it's a mindset. It's a mindset. It's a way Paul views life. It's how he frames everything that he looks at. He has a, uh, a mission 
shaped sort of view of suffering. Paul is choosing to suffer for the benefit of others, and that's the way he becomes more like Jesus. It's hard for us to comprehend that. Let me just use an illustration that could help us understand what Jesus did that is final and perfect and not lacking in any, in any way and what Paul is talking about. Let me, let me ask you to think about this example that might help clarify this. Um, the invasion at Normandy in World War II, when the Allied forces landed and established that beachhead, everybody knew victory was certain. They knew victory was certain after that incredible, vic- after that incredible battle. But they also knew battles remained to be fought. The war wasn't over. And so in Jesus, when he died on the cross, it's finished. Nothing's lacking. It already happened. But you know what? When Jesus also died on the cross, there's this not yet tension, this already not yet tension. Salvation is secured. We've landed at Normandy. Jesus did that. But we're not in glory yet. There's battles left to be fought. But the outcome is not in question. The suffering in this world is not yet finished. And we have a life to live in Jesus. We have battles to be fought, and we fight them for the sake of others. And that's what Paul's talking about. It's almost like another illustration that might help is, think of a a, a large, mature, old oak tree. And it's sheltering these young saplings around it. And if you can imagine a tree talking, saying to the young saplings, you're going to be safe and sheltered here. I'm going to take most of the wind for you. You're still going to experience wind because if you don't experience the wind and the blowing, your roots won't go down deep. So you're still going to experience that, but I'm here next to you to take some of those blows for you. I'm going to suffer for the benefit of those who come after me. Because one day my oak tree will be gone. And what has my life stood for? We need to draw fire away from them. To become like Jesus means that we're permitted to bear what others are spared. Would you write this down in your outline? Number one, how to recognize a church where you can grow in your place. It's a place where you can become like Jesus for the sake of others. Where you can become like Jesus for the sake of others. That's what Paul's doing. He's following the example of Jesus. What that means is when you find a church, you recognize a church where you can grow in your place. You recognize it by a place where leaders in the church suffer for people. They take the blows so the body doesn't. It's a place where the older generation suffers for the younger generation. It's a place where parents suffer for children, and what parent wouldn't want to trade places with their children and absorb some of that suffering? We understand that. It's a place where spiritually mature followers of Jesus actually suffer and choose to suffer and seek ways to suffer to shelter the young saplings that are around them that will outlast them. A church where We lay down our preferences for somebody else. I'd rather have it this way, but I'm laying down my preference for them. And by the way, do you realize what that does? It's an anti-consumer mentality. We're no longer saying things like, when you come to church, saying things like, well, I wonder what they're going to do here for me today. That's a consumer mentality. Instead, we come to church with what Paul has as an attitude. What am I doing for them here? How am I becoming like Jesus for their sake, those who come after me? And the next way you can recognize a church where you can grow in your place is look at verse 25. In your Bible, verse 25, Paul writes, I've become its servant by the commission God gave me. He uses the word servant. The Apostle Paul uses the word servant. Leaders are servants 
not authorities. Let me say that one more time. Leaders are servants, not authorities. Paul sees himself as a slave to God and a servant to the church. Finish what he says. Look at verse 25. He says, I become its servant by the commission God gave me. For what, for, for what reason? To present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul knows that it's the word of God, it's the word of God, which you have open before you, is what completes people, it fills them, that's where they find their fullness, is there. The word of God is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word of God, the gospel. Would you write this down? You can recognize a church where you can grow in your place when leaders are servants who fill up others on the word of God. Leaders see themselves as servants. And what you and I have before us today is a written record about Jesus called the Bible, and it is God's gift of communication and gospel teaching. Look at verse 26. Paul writes this. Look at all these big words he puts together. Verse 26, Paul says, The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. I looked at that word mystery and hidden. Immediately we think secret, like it's a secret. It's not a secret. This is not some secretive, exclusive, you're not invited to the club type of thing. That's not what this is talking about. What he's speaking of is God chose Abraham. And God promised that through Abraham that he would bless the nations. And when God told Abraham ages ago, when he told him, what he did, finally, now, fully, we're seeing with what Paul's doing, non-Jewish people are being brought into the Lord's people. God just put some more leaves in the table at Thanksgiving, and more people are coming. It's not just for one ethnic group called the Jews. It's for Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, male and female. All are and everyone is invited to come. It's disclosed to everyone. What used to be undisclosed generations ago is now disclosed in Jesus to all people. So King Jesus is God's now disclosed plan for the whole world. Would you write this down in your outline? It's a word that is now disclosed to all. He's the mystery. Jesus didn't come in secret. He brought something new into being. He brought a new people into being. And, and by the way, he keeps them on earth as a way of keep dis to keep disclosing to other new people how they can come to know Jesus. And it's unexpected who becomes the Lord's people. Look at verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God is making known something through you. You see, God has chosen the current people of God to find the future people of God. That's what the Lord did. That's what he's doing. That's what's so amazing about this as it's being unfolded. By the way, that's how the kingdom of God grows on earth. That's, that's the, his kingdom on earth is taking root through us as Christ lives in us. So would you write this down from verse 27? Write down a word that spreads to all. It's a word that spreads to all. When you look at these two verses, 26 and 27, you see issues of election and foreknowledge and God chose, and I know those are fighting words, and yet at the same time God disclosed and Jesus invites all to the table, and those are fighting words among Christians. They argue about this, but these two things are true. God has chosen a people and God has disclosed Jesus to all people. And it's mysterious how those two things can be side by side. What does that mystery do to your heart? You see, we, we want to make sure we don't have this you're not invited thing. This is our little party. That's a dangerous step to take. Here's a question. Is Maple Ridge Church here just for us or also for the benefit of those who aren't here yet? 
me say that one more time. Is Maple Ridge Church here just for us or also for the benefit of those who aren't here yet? You see, what happens when people find their place and start growing, it's easy to say, let's, let's close the doors, let's lock them. Let's just, we gotta keep this, we gotta protect this thing. We got a good thing going here. We can't let any more in here because what's gonna happen? We're gonna lose our comfort zone. And God says, no, do you understand when the gospel takes root, it starts expanding? And I'm not talking about numbers, I'm talking about changed lives. The quality of life. When a people are filled up on the word of God, what it does it turns us into conduits, not cul-de-sacs. That's what happens when God word, God's word fills us up. And the life of Jesus through you starts spreading to other people. Look at verse 28. Verse 28, it says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So we're on this road to maturity. All of us are growing in our faith. We're, we found a spot. We recognize it here at Maple Ridge. Our roots are going down deep. We see that leaders are trying to be servants who are filling others up. We, we see that we're here to become like Jesus for the sake of others. We're, we're seeing that happen. And we have this word called admonishing and teaching in verse 28. In other words, it happens through words of warning. It happens through instruction that's practical and life-changing that when we stay on Jesus, that Jesus straightens out our minds as to who's included, and that means everyone. And so later in the book of Colossians, Paul writes this. It's on the screen. He writes this in Colossians chapter 3. He says, here in the church, there's no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and Christ is in all. So it's not just let's find the Lord's people Let's find people for Jesus, but it's also, let's create an environment where they can grow in their faith in Jesus. And one of the ways that maturity happens is through everybody who comes to Jesus, everybody who comes is using the gifts the Holy Spirit has given them to build up the body of Christ. And one of the gifts that, that Paul has, remember, remember you're hearing from Pastor Paul, Pastor Paul right now, Paul has a spiritual gift called Pastor Teacher. It's a gift that God gave Paul to build up the church. In fact, he talks about it in his letter to the Ephesians church. Look at the screen. You'll see what Paul says about this gift. Paul says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Those are gifts. Look what I have underlined there. Those are gifts. Those are gifts from God. They're not corner offices. They're not titles. They're not something you wield in a church to say, you can't question me, I'm the pastor. What is that? I thought pastors were servants. And then the verse goes on, and it says this in verse 13 on the screen, until we all reach unity in the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You see, using those gifts that everyone has is how we grow in maturity. What you just saw on the screen there and what you're looking at from Pastor Paul here in Colossians, what you're seeing there is the curriculum for Christlikeness. Look at verse 28 again. He writes this, verse 28. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So Pastor Paul and his co-pastor, Timothy, they want to present everyone, not just some privileged class, not just those with power. He wants to present everyone to the Lord as the work of Jesus. He says, to, he wants to say to Jesus on that last day, here they are. This is what I poured my life out for. This is who I sacrificed for. This is who I sheltered. This is who I, I took fire for. This is, this is who I suffered for. Jesus, not because your death was lacking because only your death can forgive sins, but I need to do my part in fighting the battle until the war is done and I'm suffering for those who are coming behind me. Jesus, here they are. I'm presenting them to you. They've used their gifts. They've built up the body. 
Would you write this down? It's a word that matures all. All. It matures all of us. It's so refreshing to see that there's no hierarchy in the church. There's no pecking order. There's no offices. There's no titles. It doesn't matter if you're a free Jewish man. That's all that counted in the Old Testament, a free Jewish man. And if you came from the right lineage, you could do certain things at the temple that nobody else could do. That, that's ended. That's over. The curtain has been torn because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And he sent his spirit to live among us. Did you know that for many, many years, women were not allowed to even learn the Old Testament law. Rabbis didn't, Jewish rabbis didn't feel women were worthy to even be taught, which was why it was so earth-shattering when the two sisters, Mary and Martha, one was busy cooking, nothing wrong with making a meal. That's what she was gifted to do. The other sat at Jesus' feet, and she was learning. And Jesus said, you will never take that away from her. That was earth-shattering for her to break the role she was supposed to fill in that day. Jesus says, the curtain's been torn. She has a gift. She's a disciple. She can sit at my feet to teach others. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 3. Paul writes this. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Look with me at verse 29 in your Bible. Paul continues in Colossians, and he says this, To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I strenuously contend. That means there's a lot of energy. Paul is expending a lot of energy. And Paul's saying there's a struggle. Following Jesus takes effort. This life is like a battlefield of discomfort and distress. And Paul, Paul isn't just waiting around being inactive and being passive. Not at all. Paul's always been a man of action. But you know what he discovered? It's so much better if you live life through the energy and power of Jesus Christ than through your own human power. He's learned that unless the Lord builds a house, whoever labors, labors in vain. He's learned the life of Christ. He's learned that his relationship with Jesus is what gives him a lasting impact. You see, Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And if you abide in him, he will give you the energy you need in order for you to contend with what you're contending with this week. In fact, would you write this down in your outline? It's a word that energizes in the struggle. It fills you up, gives you strength, and it comes from time spent with him. Here's an application question. What battles are you facing this week that you need to have strength from God to face? Look to him for that strength. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, he writes, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be, this is Pastor Paul, this is Pastor Paul, encouraged. Look at that encouraged in heart you know you can recognize a church where you can grow in your place when the people have their hearts encouraged and they're not burnt out they're not burnt out look what he says next and united in love is what he says after that that's pastor paul you know you're in a church where you can grow in your place when the people there have each have their own mind does not group think but their hearts are united in love they're not divisive Look at the middle of of verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He continues. He says, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know you found a church where you can grow in your place when people have found King Jesus as their greatest treasure. The greatest treasure. 
So look at verse 4. He says, I tell you this so that no one will deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit, and I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. You see, he knows there's counterfeits and phony churches out there. He knows there's phony ministries out there who would love to just devour you. And they sound so good. They're so deceptively delicious because you know what they say? They say things like this. You know what? Stay really busy for God. Work a little harder and don't stop. By the way, that's not the voice of Jesus. Because bodies that actually work are energized by souls that have rested. Following Jesus means spending time with Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus isn't just a mental checklist of beliefs that you have, although that's very important. It's following Jesus. And he invites each of his followers to make a generous investment in their relationship with him so they don't burn out. This week I was meditating on Mark chapter 6, and, and I saw this. I want you to look on the screen, and you can see this about the apostles. They gathered around Jesus, it says on the screen. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat. They're burning out. And Jesus sees it. And look what Jesus says to them. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. That's what they needed. Look at the next part of the verse. It goes on and it says, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. You see, that's the voice of Jesus. Here's an application question from what you've just seen here. Are you so busy that you're in danger of making decisions without discernment? In fact, maybe you need to have, you know the word retreat? We talk about going on retreats. By the way, going on retreats are great. You know, we, we go to different retreat centers, and oftentimes it's full of activity and fun, and we can have some relaxation. But the type of retreat Jesus is talking about, it's more of a, a military sort of type of retreat where it's not that you're giving up in the battle. You don't give up in the battle when you go on a retreat. You say, you know what, I'm too caught up in the battle right now, and I need to have a strategic withdrawal so I can, with, I just need to withdraw a little bit so I can see. Because you know what, I, I, sometimes I wonder if I'm even fighting the right battles. Jesus says, come away. And be with me for a while. Solitude, silence, Sabbath. So would you write this down? Find Jesus, and what you'll find is this. A church that encourages your relationship with Jesus as the treasure. A place where my relationship with Jesus is the treasure. Isaiah chapter 30 says this. It's on the screen. God says to his people, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. That you would have none of it. You said, no, we'll flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we're going to ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. In other words, you have plans about how you want to fix your life. And you just exhaust yourself. And you know what God does sometimes? He lets us get to the end of our rope so that we just look and say, I've got to start taking care of something inside of here because I might be broke. And then look what Isaiah says. He says, a thousand will flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five, you will all flee away. See, they're gripped with fear. Then he says this, till you're left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. In other words, you're going to feel alone and full of fear. But then look what God says in verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for you. And so I want you today to come to Jesus as your treasure. You're all in all. Because he longs to show you compassion. He longs for you to break away just to spend time with him in your relationship. Let's pray.
at the end of the service, if you would like prayer, just know we have prayer partners who will be up here, and they would love to pray for you. But Lord, we look to you and we thank you, Jesus, that you're that treasure that we seek. You're that precious jewel. Jesus, you've said that you want us to come away by ourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. God, we don't want our bodies to break down because our souls haven't rested. And some of us don't have a choice, God. It's been forced upon us. And so we need, a special, we need special help today that we would meet with you in these quiet moments because you are our all in all. And you are the treasure that we seek, Jesus. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen.